The Augusta Museum of History continues our popular brown bag history lecture series in 2022, and we are still virtual thanks to COVID. This year's theme is the era of change, 1950 to 1980. And our February presentation is the desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia. And our guest speaker today, I am so excited to have him join us, is Dr. Joseph Hobbs. And Dr. Hobbs is a lifelong Augustan, and he is a product of the Richmond County Public School System and was in the first graduating class of T.W. Josie. I have a, a, a hook in there. My husband graduated from T.W. Josie in 1976, so go Eagles. He earned his B.S. in biology from Mercer University in 1970 and his M.D. from the Medical College of Georgia in 1974. He was one of the third group of African-American students to graduate. He completed a family medicine resi residency at MCG. And I think that's something different also because I was looking at the first female graduate from MCG and she had to go out of state to get a residency because she couldn't get one here in Augusta. So, she, he was also one of the first two African-American chief residents as well before joining the family medicine faculty in 1977 as one of the first three African-Americans full-time MCG School of Medicine faculty members. He's also went on, he's um, as a uh, MCG School of Medicine faculty member Dr. Hobbs served as director of the Department of Family Medicine's residency program, inpatient service, student education program, and clinical clerkship, as well as vice chair of academic affairs. You have been a busy man. That's all I can say. He is also the first associate dean for primary care before he assumed the role of chair of the Department of Family Medicine as the first African-American department chair. And I have been having the opportunity to talk with him and hear his stories. Dr. Hobbs is an amazing person and you will be able to find out so much about all the changes that were happening and what is going on in Georgia and in the nation to cause all of this to happen. And so he's going to talk about the events and circumstances leading to the racial desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia School of Medicine. We welcome you today, and we are so excited to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Today we are going to discuss the events and circumstances leading to the racial desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia's School of Medicine. February 7, 2017, the Medical College of Georgia sponsored a program called the 50th anniversary of the desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia. This was a celebratory event because it recognized Dr. John Hopper from Morehouse College, Dr. Frank Rump from Fort Valley State College as the first African Americans to enter the Medical College of Georgia in the 1967 freshman class, eventually being the first African American graduates of the Medical College of Georgia School of Medicine in 1971. This event for the most part dealt with their identification, selection, the challenges that they had in those first years at the Medical College of Georgia, uh, along with giving, giving acknowledgement to those people within the Medical College of Georgia that were a part of that process. It started with Dr. Walter G. Rice, the Dean of the Medical College of Georgia in 1966, who came to his admissions committee and asked them to select two, and only two, African-American students to enter the freshman class of 1967. This actually made maybe a little concern to be expressed by the admissions committee because they had never seen an African-American application to the medical school. But Dean Rice produces a list of students who had applied to the Medical College of Georgia that year, from which they were to make that decision. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> that likely means that Dr. Rice had seen lists like this before. 
and so had his predecessors. But those lists more than likely were being administratively managed because of the segregation policy of the Medical College of Georgia at that point in time that made those individuals not eligible for admission to the school and they were probably sent letters of rejection because of the, the segregation policies of the school and under those circumstances hopefully they also got messages that told them about other alternatives to get medical education outside of the state. Now, why did Dr. Rice have the authority at that point in time to mandate the desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia? Was it because of his own personal character, his political beliefs, or the fact that he felt that segregation was not fair and was not humane? Probably not. Because I bet you that there were other issues in the background that gave Dr. Rice the authority, the mandate to desegregate the Medical College of Georgia at that point in time. So let's discuss the backstory to that. Because there's a funny sort of interrelationship between the universities, their medical schools, and their hospital affiliates. And that interaction between those entities have existed throughout the existence of the Medical College of Georgia. They served them well under slavery supported societies. It served them well in desegregated societies. But it was also the basic relationship that caused desegregation to fold eventually in the mid-60s. So in order to look at that relationship, let's go back to the early 19th century society. And we're going to use Richmond County as our prototype to look at Southern medical education for the years from 1800 to uh, the 1967 desegregation of the Medical College of Georgia. So Richmond County and its environs, this was a slave driven dependent community. Enslaved African Americans imported uh, to the area were supporting the agricultural industry of tobacco and cotton. Fully 49% of the average population from 1800 to 1860 were enslaved blacks. Only 2% were free blacks. This large population had substantial interactions with each other between white and black because it was big. So when we were looking at public health concerns, illnesses in one group and illnesses in the other group could impact each other. So the public health issues regarding recurrent febrile illnesses, acute and chronic diseases, injuries that were disproportionately impacting poor Augustans and enslaved persons were of concern to the city leaders at that point in time. Unfortunately, there was only 100 Georgia physicians pre-1800, so a deficit of trained physicians to respond to the health care needs of a large and growing population, free and enslaved. The first municipal hospital called City Hospital for Indigent Sick opened in 1818 and becoming the second oldest municipal hospital system in Georgia, and now is manifested in current times as the University Hospital here in Augusta. Council approves the use of the city hospital later in 1826 for medical lectures, because in that environment, there were physicians who were talking about building a medical school to provide a physician workforce to support the healthcare issues of the community. Later in 1828, as the medical school idea is coming to fruition, the city council approves property for medical education if the proposed medical school faculty provided care for the city's sick and poor. And hence began that unique relationship between the medical school and its hospital affiliate. They needed each other in order to respond to the educational and the health care needs of the community. MCG becomes the Medical College of Georgia after its establishment in uh, 1828 uh, by 1833. And MCG now is the 13th oldest U.S. medical school and the third, is, third oldest uh, medical school in the Southeast. Now, all Southern medical schools were close to African Americans. Now, of course, we're talking about those small number of free African Americans because slaves certainly were not going to get access to these uh, medical schools. 
a few African Americans matriculated at other universities outside of the South to include places like Rush, Harvard, and Yale. David Peck becomes the first African American to graduate from a U.S. medical school at Rush in Chicago in 1847. Now, these matriculations in these all-white medical schools were not without controversy. In fact, Harvard accepted three African Americans to its School of Medicine, but expelled them several months later due to racist white student protests in 1850. Care venues for African Americans who were enslaved included work sites, slave quarters, homes if they were free, uh, African Americans, and infirmaries. The faculty of the Medical College of Georgia operated in this slave-dominated society uh, in that they purchased Grandison Harrison, a slave, in 1852 as a janitor, and he was the second resurrection man, the first being in 1934. Faculty members, doctors Robert and Henry Campbell, opened the Jackson Street Hospital and Surgical Infirmary for Negroes in 1854. That infirmary increased students' access to a learning environment where there was a concentration of colored people with disease processes that made it an excellent learning environment for those white students. Because these were enslaved people, their presence in the infirmary was based in part on the presence of the owners of these slaves' willingness to pay for services for their slaves. So there were several impacts of the infirmary. The infirmary actually made money to pay for itself and to maintain its um, uh, livelihood. It also probably created payment opportunities for the physicians involved. And then secondarily, it increased the access of MCG students to this learning environment where a population of enslaved people with disproportionately uh, heavy incidence of acute and chronic diseases existed for study and preparing them for the environment of practice later on. In fact, the Medical College of Georgia actually advertised this association between itself and the infirmary as an indication of the reason that people should choose the Medical College of Georgia to train. Uh, and they also advertised the infirmary in planters' magazines trying to get slave owners to refer their patients or their slaves to this environment for care. After 1965, the Freeman Bureau, a federal uh, mandate, was established to address refugees, freemen, and abandoned lands in 1865. A Freeman Bureau's hospital for Negroes opened in Augusta in 1865, but it closed very rapidly. Now, the Freeman Bureau's hospital did something that was probably unintended because it was actually a prelude to future racially separated and segregated hospitals. Federal government putting together a segregated hospital for black individuals. Rapidly thereafter, in 1869, the new city hospital opened and it segregated. Two years later, the city council invests in the Colored People's Hospital, known as Freeman's Hospital, and it opens in 1871. These two hospitals uh, uh, exist, uh, and finally, the Freeman Hospital falls into disrepair and is replaced by the Lamar Hospital and Clinics for Blacks in 1895. The renovations that uh, finished themselves in 1894 for the city hospital was still incomplete, and the need for a replacement hospital was noted by city leaders and faculty from the Medical College of Georgia. The Lamar Clinic needed nurses to take care of black patients in that environment, in that very, very segregated environment. And so, through the cooperation between Dr. William Daltrey and Lucy Craft Laney, the Lamar Training School opened to produce black nurses. University Hospital is opened in 1915. White patients on the Barrett Wing, black patients on the Lamar Wing, a segregated facility under one umbrella. The Lamar School of Nursing for Blacks and the Barrett School of Nursing for Whites actually merged in 1965 and ended segregated nursing education two years before MCG desegregated its medical school. This is a picture of the University Hospital with the Barrett and Lamar Wing, Lamar Wing on the uh, right and the Barrett Wing on the left, the administrative corridor on the right. So 
As attempts were made to facilitate the sufficiency of former enslaved uh, individuals, there was the Emancipation Proclamation, the Freedmen Bureau activity, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, all occurring in the chaotic environment of the Reconstruction period. That provoked a backlash within the South where there were continual expansion of black holes that sought to remove privileges and opportunities for black individuals and to create environments that actually separated those environments and access to services based upon race. These became codified in law as the emergence of Jim Crow laws occurred beginning in 1877 and persisted up until the first half and beyond of the 20th century. And in fact, it became even codified more with the Supreme Court's decision in Plessy versus Ferguson that rules that segregation with equal facilities and services is indeed constitutional. And that's in, 19, in, 18, uh, that's in 1896. All of this created lack of access to primary and secondary education for any black student in Augusta, Georgia, or in the South as well. And therefore, without this primary and secondary education, their ability to get to higher education was stalled. There was paths that were available because 22 HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, existed by 1870, 45 by 1880, and 64 by 1890. There were actually 13 black medical schools that were created between 1870 and 1907. Now, there was a problem that happened with all these medical schools. In fact, at that point in time, in 1910, there were 155 medical schools. They were, some were good and some were of dubious character. And under those circumstances, this evaluation was an attempt to e make sure that uh, they evaluated the capacity of the existing medical schools to produce appropriate physician workforce to meet the nation's needs. So of the 155 medical schools visited, only 89 were in operation in 1925. Many of them closed because of recommendations to close, and others found themselves having to consolidate with other institutions. There were seven black medical schools in existence at the time of the Flexner visit, and the Flexner report provided recommendations for closure for seven of them, leaving only the medical schools of Howard and Meharry in operation. Howard University School of Medicine in 1920 had 23 seats. In 1948, the year that I was born, they had 67 seats. Meharry had the same and similar numbers of seats at that same time. So the pathway for medical education for black students was very, very narrow. 52 of the 78 accredited medical schools with some, and I emphasize the word some, open admissions for blacks by 1945. Only 52 of the 78. The 26 of that 78 were medical schools that were entirely closed to blacks, and all of them were in southern or border states by 1945. Unfortunately, MCG was one of those. After the Second World War, black veterans with the GI Bill find themselves in possession of a way to pay for the cost of higher and professional education. They begin to seriously solicit opportunities to attend state universities for their educational uh, goals and aspirations. Because of this, there was issues that occurred within the South that tried to put into place processes that would limit black students' access to these state-supported schools, and under those circumstances, maintain the segregated environment in those settings. The Southern Regional Educational Board was a process where they facilitated Southern state sponsorships of out-of-state higher education for their students. For example, if they had uh, if they did not have a school of optometry, for example, and in one particular uh, state, this state would buy seats for students to pursue optometry in another state. Now, this appeared to be a pretty good idea, but this idea was hijacked by Southern governors, Southern politicians, and 
the Southern Conference of Governors in 1949, led by South Carolina's Governor Strom Thurmond. What they cooked up as a deal was an opportunity for them to purchase Meharry Medical College to educate black physicians outside of their state such that they maintained their segregated state schools or they slowed the process of desegregation. That was in 1949. Now, the uproar from Meharry alumni was substantial. Uh, and this process found itself dying a slow death over the course of the next 18 months as the Southern governors were not able to convince federal authorities and others of the uh, reasonableness of this particular process. The problem was is that they did not buy Meharry, but the process of buying seats at Meharry for the education of black students in their state outside of their state still existed. 12 of the 24 Southern medical schools are closed to blacks. That's in 1960. 14 SREB student aid contacts, contracts in medicine were awarded to black students to attend Meharry Medical College in 1967, the year that John and Frank entered the medical college of Georgia. 61% of black medical students in 1969 were trained at Howard and Meharry when there were three black students at the Medical College of Georgia. Now, the environment was changing. Remember that the Supreme Court had invalidated the 1875 Civil Rights Act in 1883. Plessy versus Ferguson was in play. But in the 1930s, there were a series of lower court and Supreme Court decisions that began to punch holes into the separate but equal context of the Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the legal grounds by which communities segregated themselves. Now, the Hill Burton Hospital Survey and Construction Act was approved in 1948, which was an act designed to build hospitals throughout the nation, especially in the South, to deal with the post-World War II healthcare crisis. Now remember that MCG becomes an autonomous unit of the Board of Regents in 1950, so kind of gives you a sense of where they are fitting within all of this. The Hill Burton Hospital Survey Construction Act permits, unfortunately, separate but equal. It could not pass because Southern politicians, governors, representatives, and senators balked at being able, not being able to build hospitals that were segregated and that part of the legislation in, in, included the opportunity for those hospitals to be built and to be segregated. A whole host of other Supreme Court uh, decisions ending in Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, which had far reaching impact, not only for primary and secondary education, for state supported uh, education and, higher, uh, and uh, professional education as well. In fact, the Veterans Administration's hospitals issued desegregation mandates to it, all of its facilities in 1953, and they fully achieved full desegregation, and one would wonder about what that full desegregation really was, but that was achieved in 1954, fully two months after the decision of Brown versus the Board of Education. So one of MCG's hospital affiliates, teaching affiliates, is now desegregated in 1954. MCG builds this hospital in four. The construction support comes from the Hill Burton Act. And remember the Hill Burton Act permitted it to open as a segregated facility. This is the familiar infrastructure of the Medical College of Georgia, which has been adorned by a whole bunch of other construction today. It looks eerily reminiscent of the University Hospital built in 1915. An administrative wing in the middle and two clinical wings north and south side of it. The difference is, is that this was not a black wing and that was not a white wing. The segregation occurred in a different way. It occurred this way. This is the floor plan of the clinical floors of the Medical College of Georgia. 
The 10s and 20 halls housed white patients. The 30s and 40s hall housed black patients. Black patients were toward the back of the hospital. White patients were toward the front of the hospital. Plans like this, floor plans like this, were distributed across the South as, south, as Southern uh, states tried to find ways to take advantage of the Heal Burton Act to build these hospitals and to build them on a segregated platform. They had come to the realization that they couldn't build two hospitals and say that these two hospitals are going to be equal for both blacks and white. So they looked at the possibility of building them under the same umbrella and trying to find ways to segregate the activities within the context of these new building structures. But the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Simpkins versus Cohen Memorial Hospital rules no discrimination in a federally funded hospital. That's 1964. And guess what? Talbot Memorial Hospital is a hospital that receives federal funds. They were the Hill Burton funds. And then the Title VI, uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 makes discrimination in federally funded hospitals really against the law. It means that you can go to jail if you break this law. And then finally, the nail in the coffin was Medicare and Medicaid participation mandating hospital desegregation in 1965, the failure to which will result in loss of federal funding. And not only could hospitals be entangled in this, but medical schools receiving federal monies likewise because of research support from the federal government and educational support from the government. And so the hammer that came down that all of a sudden made hospitals within the South begin to desegregate rapidly and in some instances quietly was the potential of the absence of funding and the dollar, not necessarily a change in consciousness. MCG desegregated in 1964 probably because of its use of federal funds for its building arrangements, so therefore it was vulnerable. Uh, there was a cafeteria event there where uh, on some day in 1964, black uh, employees came down to the colored cafeteria only to find that it was closed and then they were directed to the white cafeteria and there was a lot of suspicion about what that might mean. Afterwards, the hospital had general staff notification of the desegregation activities that were occurring. Non-racial discriminatory room assignments occurred. Desegregation of waiting rooms, restrooms, and food services occurred. And there was further integration of the hospital staff, which probably took a lot more time. And these were processes that uh, probably occurred over months to accomplish. So what did Dean Rice have? Dean Rice had the realities of an evolving federal and judicial social and political environment, knowing where that was going. The University Hospital had been forced to desegregate in 1961. Voluntary desegregations occurred at Georgia Tech in 1961, and the private universities of Emory and Mercer desegregated on their own in 1963. And MCG, the Board of Regents, were fully aware that if they did not comply, they would lose access to federal funds, and MCG as an institution was reliant on federal funds for education, for clinical services, and for research. In the background was an activated black community advocating for change and directly confronting the leadership of the Medical College of Georgia the need for the need to do that. There was probably within the Medical College of Georgia core faculty members who were also advocating for change as well. So Dean Dreich's request of the MCG admissions committee was accepted. And they found John Hopper from Morehouse College and Frank Rump from Fort Valley State College. And they became the first students to enter the Medical College of Georgia in 1967. Now, the desegregation process didn't stop there because MCG had trouble recruiting black Georgia students because of the legacy of its segregated environment. They had trouble competing for black faculty and staff for the same reasons as well as black residents and postgraduates. To address that issue, they actually put together in 1970 
one of the longest standing student pipeline programs called SEEP to engage students at the high school and college level about the opportunities for health sciences, education, and professional uh, uh, careers at the Medical College of Georgia. The college has found itself over the years increasing its commitment to diversity and inclusion and living out that commitment to diversity and, include, and inclusion as it seeks to continue the process of desegregation, which probably in this particular environment is, calling, is called a commitment or an enduring commitment to the issues around diversity and inclusion. The Stony Medical Dental Pharmaceutical Society's support of MCG's early African-American medical students was an essential component of their successful matriculation, as was Augusta's African-American nursing community, many of whom had direct and indirect connections with the old Lamar School of Nursing. And because of them, we have John Harper, Frank Rump, in the first desegregated class of the School of Medicine in 1967. Tommy Leonard in the second desegregated class in 1968. O.C. Simon Simpson, Ph.D. from Fort Valley State College, in the fourth African American in the, in the third desegregated class, and he became the fourth African American student to be admitted. Seven African American students were admitted in 1970 in the fourth desegregated class. This was a class of which I was proud to be a member. And the fifth desegregated class, in 1971, 14 students entered the class of 136 students. Now, on this slide, there are only 12, because there are two people who deserve special note from that class, because they were Elizabeth Hawkins and Angela Sims, who entered the class of 1971 and graduated in 1975 and became the first African Americans to enter MCG School of Medicine and the first African American women to graduate from MCG School of Medicine. The first African American graduates of MCG, John Harper, Frank Rump, joined by Joyce Beeks from the School of Nursing. And the first African American part-time faculty member, Alan Brown in 1970, First African-American resident, James Hatcher and Tubby Leonard in 1972. First African-American chief resident, uh, David Ronald Spearman, and I was in that group. MCG's first African-American full-time faculty members, yours truly, Ruth Neal and David Ronald Spearman. And thus began the process of the integration or the desegregation of the entire MCG environment, including the Dental College of Georgia, the College of Nursing, and the College of Allied Health Sciences. And that process of desegregation continues today as embodied by the school's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Thank you.